John chapter 16. And we'll take up the reading at verse, verse 24. John chapter 16, reading from verse 24 to the end of the chapter. Hitherto have ye asked nothing in my name. Ask and ye shall receive that your joy may be full. These things have I spoken unto you in Proverbs, but the time cometh when I shall no more speak unto you in Proverbs, but I shall show you plainly of the Father. At that day ye shall ask in my name, and I say not unto you that I will pray the Father for you, for the Father himself loveth you, because you have loved me and have believed that I came out from God, I came forth from the Father and am come into the world. Again I leave the world and go to the Father. His disciples said unto him, Lo, now speakest thou plainly and speakest in no proverb. Now are we sure that thou knowest all things and needest not that any man should ask thee. By this we believe that thou camest forth from God. Jesus answered them, Do ye now believe? Behold, the hour cometh, yea, is now come that ye shall be scattered, every man to his own, and shall leave me alone. And yet I am not alone, because the Father is with me. These things have I spoken unto you, that in me you might have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. Amen. And may God add his blessing to that reading of his own work. Our text is found in verse 33. In me ye have peace, in the world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. Lord Jesus Christ, of course, um, in these chapters 14 through 16, uh, with his imminent departure, has been seeking to comfort and to strengthen his disciples with the, um, uh, the imminent departure of himself. He has dealt with the truth about himself and, of course, spoken to them about his death, violent death, which, of course, at this at this time um, of speaking, uh, they don't quite grasp fully understand uh, what that involves. And he has spoken to them also of the victory that eventually shall be theirs at the coming of the Comforter of the Holy Spirit. He warns them, he forewarns them that they will experience opposition, uh, that they will be faced with persecution but they will overcome that also. But he says, in me, not out of me, but in me, he says, in me, you, he says, will have peace. In chapter 14 and verse 27, peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, but as he says here in verse 33, be of good cheer, be comforted, that is. This um, ends the discourse in the upper room, the comfort and the victory that he speaks of to his disciples. He's already spoken of the world, again in chapter 14 and verse 17, even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. Verse 22, Judas saith, Lord, how is it that thou wilt manifest thyself unto us and not unto the world? Verse 30, hereafter I will not talk much with you, for the prince, the ruler of this world, cometh and hath nothing in me. And he tells them that that world will hate them and, of course, will hate us too. In John 15, verse 19, if you are of the world, the world would love his own, but because you are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, 
therefore the world hateth you. He tells them they will be excommunicated by this world and they will even kill you, they will put you to death. John 16 verse 2, they shall put you out of the synagogues, yea, the time cometh that whosoever killeth you will think that he doeth God service. And that continues, of course, even to this very day. Last Sabbath afternoon, I heard the report uh, from a minister um, of the doings of the Islamic State in North Africa. Um, just a short time ago, they were celebrating, they were declaring how that they had killed in the space of two months uh, Ju June and July this year, they had killed over 190 Christians. Uh, following which they, they make their great uh, exclamation, Allah Akbar, that is, God is great. They do it thinking that they are doing God service. Just as Jesus predicted to his disciples, so it is even today. But the Holy Spirit, he's coming and he will convict them and he will leave them with no excuse for their unbelief. Uh, chapter 16 and verse 8, when he has come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment, of judgment because the prince of this world, their ruler is judged and, um, and, and so on. The world for the Christian believer is to be not a party, but a grim place, and it will be increasingly so as time goes on. Even to the very end of the age, it will be a fearsome place even then for the elect to dwell. But says Jesus, rejoice because you're mine. I am yours and you are mine. You can't lose, you have the victory. This world that will persecute you, harass and hound you, I have overcome the world. Victory belongs to Jesus Christ and to his followers. They confederate together against the Lord and against his anointed and against his anointed servants too, some too, but God in heaven laughs at them. He holds them in utter scorn. So Jesus tells us tonight to be of good cheer here in verse 33. The world, the peace, and the calling. The world, what does he mean by the world? Well, he's talking about the society of the ungodly, the wicked, and unbelieving. They are, super, they are supervised by its one head, the prince, the ruler of darkness, even Satan. 1 John chapter 5 and verse 19, and we know that we are of God and the whole world lieth in wickedness under the sway of the ruler of this world. It wouldn't be an extremity to say that the world that Jesus talks about is a demonic world because it's ruled by the prince of this world, even Satan. And they are united together in their opposition against God, against Christ, against his cause, and against the church. So it's a dangerous foe. It's the world is not our friend, and it must not be our friend. James, he warns us in chapter 4 and verse 4 that if you're a friend of the world and the world's a friend of you, then you are no friend of God's. The, the, the world, this world that Jesus speaks about, it operates against us in two ways. One in the way of temptation and the other in the way of tribulation, as Jesus terms it here. In tempting us, in luring us, seeking to seduce us, it seeks to corrupt the church in the same way that Satan in the garden corrupted Adam. The world obeys Satan, its master, and it seeks through his operations within the world, it seeks to, in the eyes of God's people, it seeks to make sin look attractive and beneficial 
and makes righteousness, holiness, and godliness appear miserable and evil. Through, through the, the media, through its advertising, through its, its entertainment, um, it operates in the realm of the flesh and seeking, of course, to, to lure and to draw God's people to the world and even to bring the world into the church if it can. 2 Peter verse 1, 4, the apostle says, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust, we've escaped that and we are not to go back there. 1 John 2 verse 16, for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life is not of the Father but is of the world. That world hates us, beloved, seeks to tempt us, to lure us, seeks to bring us down. Jesus our Lord, he has overcome that world. It promotes sexual immorality. You can't even pick up a newspaper now without being, being confronted with uh, some form of sexual immorality, pornography even. It uh, seeks to promote self-indulgence, materialism and greed. <coughs> In Titus chapter 2, verse 11, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Of course, uh, in seeking to... Uh, temptation is one of the... One of the um, one of the, the primary instruments, of course, that, that Satan uses to, to seek to corrupt God's people and to corrupt the church. If you go back to the, uh, the Old Testament, Balaam, that, the false prophet, three times he was, he was brought to, um, to curse God's people, but God wouldn't allow him because God had blessed his people. He says he looks upon Israel and he sees no sin in them, and, and he cannot. He wants to, but he cannot curse them. And, uh, but but he, he wants the reward. He, he wants what has been promised him by Balak, the, the king. And so what does he do? Ingeniously, if he can bring the displeasure of God upon Israel, so what does he do? He uses the Moabite women to infiltrate Israel and bring sexual immorality amongst them and thus the wrath of God plague falls upon Israel. Satan's operations, his devices, his wiles, his schemes have not changed. The other one, of course, is tribulation. Jesus says here, in the world ye shall have tribulation. The word tribula tribulation here means, means to, to pressurize, it means to squeeze, uh, the world begins, you can see it in the course of the disciples um, following Pentecost. Uh, it begins with ridicule. Uh, look at these men, look at the, the time it is. Uh, they're full of new wine, uh, ridiculing them, scorning them. And then it turns to threats. And then it progresses from there to fines, imprisonment, torture, and eventually even to death. We enter through the straight gate into the narrow pathway. We enter through the turnstile into that narrow pathway. And it's narrow. Why is it narrow? Because it's the way of tribulation. It's the way of pressure. We're pressurized on every side. No, no sooner are we through that turnstile, we're full of joy, we're praising the Lord, everything's wonderful, uh, and we think we've got this good news, uh, Jesus Christ has saved us, we're full of the joy of the Lord, we've just been loose, we've just been set free, and we think that, you know, everybody's going to love this. But it's not long before we, we find ourselves being squeezed, being pressurized, family members who turn against us, friends who turn against us, uh, our neighbors, work colleagues, and of course, well, even the state, even the government uh, 
is against us. In 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 12, yea, and all that will live godly in Christ shall suffer persecution. It's the norm for the Christian, but be of good cheer. You are pressurized and you will be pressurized to the end, says the Lord Jesus. You will be squeezed out of this world if they can. But be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. Jesus likewise was, likewise was tempted, likewise was squeezed. And Satan, of course, has his employees that he uses to, to do this squeezing, this pressurizing. But Christ, just as has been promised, Christ has overcome the world overcome even the prince of this world, the ruler of this world. In Genesis 3 uh, and verse 15, we have the mother promise, and Jesus Christ, the Son of God, has crushed the foe. He has brought down his heel upon the serpent's head and crushed him. He's a defeated foe. He's a, he's a, he's a junkyard dog on a chain. And Jesus Christ has the chain, the other end of the chain in his hand. The world has been overcome. So be of good comfort, be of good cheer, says Jesus. I have overcome the world. You're being pressurized. You're being harassed by the world, by friends, by fa unbelieving family members even. Be of good cheer. I have overcome the world, says Jesus. Secondly, Secondly, the peace in me, he says, in me, in Jesus, is peace. The peace of the world, the world's peace, of course, is a false peace. It's a counterfeit peace. I was preaching some, some a couple of years ago now uh, down there in, in Nantwich one lovely sunny afternoon, and an elderly gentleman came to me, came by me, and he said, man, he said, you're disturbing the peace. I said to him, sir, it's a false peace. A false peace, but that's that's the world's peace, you know. Uh, sitting out in a sunny uh, summer's afternoon drinking coffee, that's as peace like, you know. Uh, the end of the war in Ukraine, that's the world's peace, but that's not the peace of God. The peace of God, the peace of this world is a transient peace, it's not a lasting peace. The peace of this world is just simply the absence of trouble. The absence of trouble is not peace. Peace is a right relationship with God. Romans 5 verse 1, therefore being justified by faith, being made right with God by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. The world's at war with God and the world's at war with us. The world hates us and hates Christ and hates his cause. It's at enmity against God and God's at enmity against them. Because of man's sin, because of man's rebellion against God, because of the curse of God that lies upon this world, because of the wrath of God that hangs over them like the sword of Damocles waiting to fall upon them at any divinely given moment. But peace comes to us as a result of the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. The forgiveness that flows down to us from that cross, the curse is lifted from off of us. Galatians 3.13, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. He took it for, uh, for us. Sin has been paid for over that cross. Now it is, the words are written, paid in full. Peace with God, peace with God, the enmity, the war has been brought to a conclusion. Peace with God and the peace of God, that peace of God that passeth all understanding. The objective peace and the subjective, the outward and the inner peace. My peace I give unto you, in me ye shall have peace, be of good comfort. Christ, he is our peace. His reconciling blood, his going to that cross, defeating 
defeating the enemy of our souls, overcoming the world, shedding his blood, taking our curse, taking the wrath that was due to us. The world perishes, but we have good cheer, we have good comfort. The world has been overcome. A world that lies under the wrath of God. Romans 1 verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all the ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold, hold down the truth and unrighteousness in their wickedness. So, beloved, when, when our hearts are troubled, you know, for, for whatever reason, or, or, or we're distressed, or... or, or are our pieces disturbed for, for whatever reason? The remedy is always to come back to this, to come back to what Christ has done for us, accomplished for us and in us. The remedy is faith, to believe, to take his word on board, to remember his word. Be of good cheer in me, you have peace. Be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. And of course, well, our tendency is, you know, when we are, when we are distressed, you know, when we are downcast for whatever reason, our, our, our tendency is naturally, of course, is to, well, is to withdraw, you know, in, into our own cave, you know, and just um, have our own little pity party. But that, beloved in Christ, that's not the answer. The, the answer is, is to attend the means of grace. Because we need the fellowship of one another. Even the Lord Jesus Christ himself needed the fellowship of his men. You know, in the Garden of Gethsemane, where he's wrestling, he's wrestling with the, with the enemy, and, and he's wrestling with his Father's will, that separation, that abandonment, that forsakenness, forsakenness, and he turns to his men, and they're asleep. What, could you, could you not watch with me? He says, for just for one hour, I, I, th this time when I needed you, he needed the fellowship of his men. How much more do we need the fellowship of one another? When you're missing or I'm missing, maybe there's somebody here who needs you. The answer, the answer is not withdrawal into our own into our own corner, but to be there at the means of grace, and to be blessed and encouraged and lift lifted out of the distress by the means of grace. Not to neglect, but again and again to embrace the truth and walk in the truth, hold the truth. The world's been overcome. Be of good cheer. Because God, the Father, he says, the Father himself loveth you. Yeah? The Father, Father loves you. That's John 3.16. He's not talking about the world out there. He's not talking about every man head for head, for God so loved the world. He loved the world of his own people. He loved the world of his elect. He, he, he loved the world of believers, that whosoever believeth shall not perish. Put it in context, John 3 verse 5, you must be born again. Those who have been born again and then regeneration brought to repentance and faith towards the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the world that God loves and still loves. He loves his own. Soon his disciples, their peace is going to be disturbed. Peter's going to leave that courtyard and he's going, to be, he's going to be in bitter tears because he's denied his Lord three times because of a servant girl. John's going to be stood under that cross with, with, with the mother of our Lord Mary. And he's going, his peace is going to be disturbed. And others of them are going to flee in absolute terror. But be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. They don't realize at this time. They don't know how. They don't really know what he means. They don't grasp it. They don't understand it because the Spirit's not yet come. But following the resurrection, their joy will be complete. Their peace will return through faith. Even Thomas, even the unbelieving Thomas, after a week of unbelief, the risen Christ comes to him. Be not believing, 
but believe. And Thomas, Thomas is restored again to his trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Beloved, this world, this wicked, ungodly world that persecutes with its religion as well, that, that persecutes us, the people of God, all the nations together, Isaiah, he tells us, they're like a drop in a bucket. All the fearsome powers of this world that you can think about that confederate in evil against the Lord and, and against his anointed and against his anointed servants, against us as people, that is. Revelation 17, verse 17 for God hath put in their hearts to fulfill his will and to agree and give their kingdom unto the beast until the words of God shall be fulfilled. All they do is fulfill God's will. That's all that they're able to do. Because Jesus Christ is risen, ascended, and he reigns. Everything is under his feet. All power in heaven and earth is given unto him. There's nothing, nothing, nothing falls out in this world but by the divine permission of our Lord Jesus Christ. He's in control, not them. So on the basis of truth, what is the truth? In the world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. That's the truth. On the basis of that truth, beloved, we must cultivate, cultivate, even in these dark days in North Wales, with all the unbelief and all the discouragements and, and, and the diminishing of the churches and, and the, the worldliness coming into other churches. We must cultivate a more cheerful attitude. Cut down the doubts and the fears, the difficulties and the failures because we are more than conquerors to him who loved us and overcame the world. And to be more biblically realistic, we have the inner assurance of our justification that we have been freely justified by faith. We are in the right standing with God, that is. We have been justified unto all eternity. There's nothing, there is nothing that can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing can disturb that justification. We have been adopted into the family of God. The two justification and adoption, they're so close that they're almost one and the same. They're so close together. When the sinner who truly believes that moment from, from Jesus a pardon receives, uh, the, 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 the father is the judge in his judge's robes and, and he brings down his gavel and, and he says to the sinner, he says, justified. Not, not just not guilty, but justified, righteous. And then immediately he takes off his judge's garments, he puts down his gavel, he comes down off of the bench, and he hugs the sinner and says, Welcome into my family, my son, my daughter. We have the inner assurance of our justification, of our adoption, of the Father's love for us. Our lives are hid inseparably in Christ. Romans 8, verse, verses 35 and following. Nothing in heaven, nothing in hell, nothing in earth, nothing in all this world can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So whatever comes, whatever the world throws at us, his promise here holds good. Be of good cheer, be of good comfort. I have overcome the world. We serve the lion of the tribe of Judah. We serve the risen Christ. Now the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that ye may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Ghost 
Beloved, take hold of God's word in faith and live out of it. Be of good cheer. Because that, thirdly, that is our calling. Be of good cheer, he says. It's in the imperative. It's an admonition. It's, if you like, a command. Be of good cheer is to be of good comfort. Be comfortable in this world, yes. It corresponds with the miracles of Jesus. You know, when he says to the, when he says to the waves, the storm, when he says, be still, and, and it's still. Well, he says to you tonight, be of good comfort. He says, to, he says to the daughter, be, be of good comfort. Uh, your faith has, has, has made thee whole. Again and again through, uh, through the Gospels, uh, be, be not afraid. It, it is I. It is I. Be, be not afraid. The intent here, you see, is to give, is to give encouragement because... The disciples are so discouraged. He's, he's, he's told them he's going away. And, and, the, and they don't understand his language. The things that he's saying about his going away. Where is he going to? And, and why is he leaving us? And, and all this stuff about, about tribulation and about persecution. Uh, they, they're deeply discouraged and, and they're distressed. But his intent is, is to encourage them. The disciples, of course, um, uh, they're troubled, they're sorrowful, they're, they're afraid, and, and, and he tells them, he says, you will weep, you will lament when, when they see that cross. Uh, the, the two disciples are on the road to Emmaus, they, they, they've given up. And when Jesus meets them, what is it they say? Well, what, what we had hoped, Jesus of Nazareth, we had hoped, in other words, past tense, no, we don't. We've given up hope. Stir, stir yourselves, beloved in Christ, and lay hold of the comfort of this comfort. My peace I give unto you, and no one but no one can take it from you. Why? Because the world, the world has been overcome by him it cannot touch us. The worst it can do to us is send us to be with him, is send us to glory. That's the very worst it can do. So, so we enter in at the straight gate. We enter in through that turnstile. And the way, the way is narrow. We are faced with, with all kinds of temptations, all kinds of pressure, all kinds of tribulation, all the time, all the time, the world's trying to squeeze us. Even today, in our own nation, they're trying to squeeze us out of society. They've almost silenced our, 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 our voice in the public domain. And, and they seek even to, 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 to silence us in the public square, in the marketplace. All the time, squeezing, squeezing, pressurizing us. And of course, part of our problem is that we're not used to it. We've had, an, an, in this country of ours, we've had an abnormal time of peace and quiet. We've had things for so long, hundreds of years, we've had things our own way. We've never known the persecution that our brethren are facing in places like in places like Northern Africa, in places like the Middle East and India, where Christians today are being slaughtered, are being burned to death. And so we're not we're not we're not used to it. We're not used to it. But we're not to allow ourselves to be squeezed into a corner and squeezed, pressurized into silence. Yeah? And, and to conform 
to conform to the culture that they keep throwing at us, you know, all their LGBT stuff and transgenderism business and all their worldly entertainment, crowding, pressurizing itself into the churches uh, uh, around you. Hold the line, stand fast. I have overcome the world. The answer is not to join it and the answer is not to invite it in amongst you. That's fatal. Pressurized to conform and many churches and many denominations have already, in the Western world, have already folded, have already given in. Even the Church of Scotland in which I was raised as a boy has now driven the final nail into its coffin in subscribing to same-sex sodomite marriage. Beloved in Christ, that pressure, that pressure, that pressure, that tribulation, but we must withstand it fight against it by faith. I have overcome the world. Be of good comfort. Be of good cheer. By the power of the cross of our Savior, our Lord Jesus Christ, we have the victory. We have the victory. The victorious are not those that give way the victorious are not those that cast the word of God aside, compromise the word of God, compromise the worship of God. The victorious are those who stand fast upon the word of God and refuse, refuse to be pressurized, refuse to be squeezed out of it. Remember how this discourse of the Lord Jesus Christ began. If you go back to chapter 14 and to the first uh, and to the opening verses. Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. Our Lord Jesus Christ, believe, ye believe in God, believe also in me. Trust in me, confide in me, in my word, that which I am saying to you, even here, these things I have spoken, these things, I am speaking to you tonight, holy, well, evangelical church. These things I am speaking unto you, that in me, in me, you might have peace. In the world, ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. Be of good comfort. I, Jesus, your Lord, your Master, your Savior, I, who died and rose again from the dead and am alive forevermore. I have overcome the world. And that victory, beloved in Christ, is yours and mine, my faith. So let us stand fast. Let us be of good comfort. Let us be of good cheer. Let us rejoice and be glad. More than conquerors, through him who loved us and gave himself for us. Amen. Let's uh, sing the.